Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Darren Newsom analyzes the USDA's March crop report. Elwin Taylor looks ahead to weather conditions during the growing season. Brad Lubin explains efforts in Congress to label GMO foods. And Tim Shaver discusses research on removing corn residue from crop ground. Darren Newsom from DTN is our market analyst this week. The USDA's March crop report released Wednesday contained no major surprises. Internationally, the agency didn't make any adjustments in corn or soybean production in either Argentina or Brazil. So the focus on reports will now shift to March 31st when the USDA is scheduled to release its calculations on quarterly grain stocks and prospective plantings. We talked with Darren at the Triumph of Ag Expo in Omaha's CenturyLink Center Wednesday afternoon about weather concerns this year, the strength of the dollar, and that day's supply and demand estimates. Really, as March so often is, it was a very quiet report. Uh, all of the grains, as far as to, you know, as far as corn, soybeans, and and uh, excuse me, corn, wheat, and grain sorghum were all left unchanged as far as ending stocks go. Soybeans uh, saw a 10 million bushel increase again because uh, USDA cut crush. Interestingly enough, even though we're running behind in all three exports weren't changed at all. So I think all we're really doing here is kind of setting the table for another couple times down the road. I think we're going to wait and see what happens with the quarterly stocks numbers at the end of the month and then start to see some more adjustments come. But, you know, it was a very quiet report as far as the domestic numbers go. The real interest uh, was that in all three, again, ending stocks, global ending stocks were, dec were decreased. We saw increased demand for both uh, corn and soybeans and just some slight adjustments in wheat that brought that down as well. So I think the real interest was over in the, in the world numbers. Surprised that there was no increase in either Argentina or Brazil in either corn and soybeans? You know, I, I think it was uh, a little bit of a surprise because the talk going in was that we could actually see Brazilian production go up over 100 million metric tons and Argentina get up maybe to 59 million metric tons. But we left it alone. At least uh, USDA decided to leave it alone this time around. Again, leaving it open for another month down the road, uh, or possibly taking more time to evaluate what potential damage may have been done, say in January when there was a drought going on in that part of the world, or you know, weather problems going on in that part of the world, maybe reducing. But still, you know, the general consensus still seems to be that Brazilian production is over 100 million metric tons. So let's talk about some reasons or some possibilities for hope here for the farmer. You said one of the things that they could look at immediately is what the Fed does. Yeah. Tell me why what the Fed does is so important. I think I think next week's meeting or, or this coming week's meeting in the, by the Federal Reserve is very important to the grain markets. Uh, you know, we've seen the U.S. dollar go up and it's been very strong and it's stayed very strong for quite some time. What we really need to see happen from a grain point of view, from an export point of view, is for the dollar to start to come back down. And really the only way to do that is for the Fed to come out and say they're not going to move again in 2016 on interest rates. Do I think they're going to lower rates? No, I don't. But if they just don't do the four increases that they were talking about in December, then I think it's possible that that could be enough to finally start putting some pressure on the dollar, maybe start to increase our export possibilities a bit. One of the other hopes that you talked about was maybe some weather concerns. At what level would a weather concern help the market? Well, most notably, initially, we're going to have to, you know, it would probably come in the form of some sort of spring planting delay. 
you know, get some real wet weather in either the eastern corn belt, western corn belt. This could help the new crop market. And if we see a strong enough rally, say get 20, 30 cents in corn, 30, 40, maybe even, I'll stretch it out to 50 cents, whatever, in soybeans, that could be enough to pull the old crop market up with it. The problem with any rally in the old crop market is that there's a lot of grain yet to be sold. There's a lot of grain still being held. And so the minute we start to see those markets move, that's going to start coming to town. Those bend doors are finally going to start to open because everyone knows, everyone in the market knows that that grain has to get moved before the next harvest. Is the huge associated benefit with both of those, exports and weather, is it not necessarily the event, but perhaps the short covering that comes along with it? Yeah, yeah to me, that's probably the key. And, and right now we've got the non-commercial or the investment side holding very large net short. In other words, they've sold more contracts than they've, than they've bought positions in all three grains and fundamentally there's no reason for them to cover but if we get some sort of series of headlines say the dollar or say the weather whatever it might be a political switch situation in brazil it could lead to a round of short covering which could be the spark that really starts to set these markets in motion you know push them higher short term more probably more than anything else what do you see in the chart as far as where prices could go over the next few weeks you know I was looking more at new crop, and the move that we saw in November beans today uh, was pretty impressive, but yet it had no follow through once the reports come out. So I still think if we look at the new crop markets, that we could see you know, soybeans get up into the 920, 930 range, and in corn, maybe approach that 410, 420. As far as the cash markets, you know, we've got corn uh, down around 385, 390 as far as the national average cash price. If we can tack 20, 30 cents onto that, that might be about the best we can do. Maybe get it up close to four, maybe a little over four. And then soybeans, if we could get that same 30 to 40 cent rally in cash beans, I think we're going to see a lot of people moving because basis is going to start to weaken. If you think about long term in both corn and soybeans, do you think that you know, you get through this year, if there's not a major, major weather problem, we're gonna be in the same position next year talking about really difficult margins with expected big production. Yeah, you know, if we get through this year without a big weather scare and we produce to the level that we think that's being talked about at this point, you know, possibly the fourth year in a row of, you know, record large numbers, um, we're gonna be struggling at the same time next year. But the one difference could be is that we could be looking at a change in the long-term weather patterns. So where we might be able to get through 2016 without having a huge weather scare, by the time we get to 2017, the long-term weather may have changed to the point where it becomes more of an issue. And that could be the catalyst, or that could be the reason why we actually start moving the markets higher. Next week, we'll look at corn and soybean markets with Roy Smith. February 2016 will rank as the seventh warmest February since 1895 and also the warmest February since 2000. That could be a potential problem for some winter wheat growers, but most corn and soybean producers are likely looking further ahead to their planting and growing seasons. At the Triumph of Ag Expo in Omaha this week, we talked with Iowa State University's Elwyn Taylor about the potential weather forecast for spring and summer, but we started by asking for an update on the current standing of El Nino. El Nino is still with us, and yes, it's been a strong El Nino. It's been about number three of the top five El Ninos in strength since 1950, and it looks like it'll be with us, well, at least through planting time, but we're not sure about July and August just yet. Do you have any concerns about planting time with as much moisture as we've had? The amount of moisture we've got in the soil with almost all of the fields with tiles installed, the tiles have been running all winter getting rid of the excess moisture. That means with that much moisture in the soil to start with, it won't take very heavy rain to cause it to be way too much at planting time. And we do have some indication that we'll be following. We'll be watching how much moisture they're getting south of us because as we come into the uh, growing season, the days are getting longer, the weather patterns are moving north, the weather pattern that's moving to our Iowa and Nebraska mm -hmm. for planting season is in Arkansas right now. So we'll just watch them for a while. Now, what do you think El Nino is going to do to the growing season? We just don't know yet. We usually get an idea around the 15th of April when the summer weather patterns start developing in the Northern Hemisphere. Winter weather patterns just don't persist very well. 
And so it's more meaningful to wait till the summer ones start and then know what's happening. Then we have some accuracy to our outlook. Do you think La Nina will have an impact this growing season? La Nina always has an impact if it's there. Remember, an El Nino is not always followed by a La Nina. In fact, it's only about 50 or 60 percent of the time. So almost half the time it doesn't happen. El Nino comes, goes to neutral, and we wait five or six years, then the next El Nino comes. If we have a La Nina, it's almost always followed by an El Nino. Are there any signs to think it will go to La Nina? Just that it's done it half the time when we've had an El Nino of this strength. And so twice we went from a strong El Nino to a drought, and people remember those, well, some people do. That would be 83 and 88. But the next two strong ones, uh, one went to kind of an average crop yield, mm -hmm. and one was better than average. So it, there's about a 50-50 chance if you look at past history. Are there any past history correlations to wet years being followed by more wet years or less wet years? There's only a little bit of correlation there, and it has to do with what's going on in the ocean around Hawaii and what's going on in the ocean around Bermuda. So they don't carry over too well because the Bermuda conditions change every year. Their high pressure goes away for the winter, comes back for the summer. But out around Hawaii, that can stick around for six or seven years. So that's one we can sometimes pay attention to. And it tells us that don't count on a lot of moisture come summer. So what should farmers look at if they're trying to use the weather to market their crops even this far out of the growing season? Uh, this far out, you should look at what the history has been doing. And that's about all we can look at is the climate. We've had uh, an 18-year run of really good crop years, increasing yield, thank you plant breeders. But before that, we had 25 years of a whole lot of volatility, dry year, wet year, good yield year, bad yield year. And for 25 years, that was the 80s and around that, included that 10 years. Before that, we had 18 years of consistent yields. Before that, 25 years of volatile. If you keep adding those together, 2012 was year one of 25 years of some good years, some bad years, some good years, a lot of volatility. If you survived in farming in the 80s, do it again. Is there anything during the season that farmers can look at to use to market their crops? Everything. Uh, it's just wonderful what we can do with marketing by keeping track of the crop. Is the crop doing better than usual in your county, in your district? And that, now we have enough information, you can see what's going on in the Corn Belt. So you know what the prices will be at harvest time, if you know what the harvest is going to be. And we can do a good job of estimating the harvest now. We can do a lot better job than the USDA does. The market's gone to the USDA number. We know if that's too high or too low, and the farmer knows best. We have the information. Get on the right side of the market. That's the thing we can do as the crop grows. Is that done through accumulating growing degree days, or what data is that used by? Growing degree days, number one. That's the one thing that the USDA doesn't use. They publish it, but they don't use it. And if the nights are two degrees warmer than usual in July and August, that will cut our yield by 4%. And that isn't factored in to any USDA estimate. Later in the show, we'll get a look at weather conditions over the next few days in Al Dutcher's weekly weather forecast. The Senate Ag Committee advanced a bill last week that would create a voluntary GMO labeling system across the country. If passed, the legislation would prevent a state-by-state -state arrangement, including Vermont's mandatory labeling law set to take place in July. However, a separately pushed proposal in the Senate would require mandatory GMO labeling. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin about these efforts. It's really coming to a head uh, with the, uh, uh, the mandatory labeling in Vermont set to take effect this summer. Suddenly, Congress has the uh, impetus and the momentum to put something together on, on uh, GM food labeling. Right now, we have seen something that's moved through the House previously, and we're looking at Senate action. The Senate Agriculture Committee did forward a bill out of committee uh, that would preempt the Vermont legislation and any other state legislation. 
with a voluntary labeling guideline at the national level. There is, however, some realization that there's likely to be some compromise or alternatives considered here as it reaches the floor. One of those could push all the way to a mandatory national label that preempts state-by-state -state labeling. One of them could simply be some amendments to the voluntary labeling that says, uh, here's a voluntary labeling guideline with benchmarks. Benchmarks for disclosure, and if those benchmarks aren't met, voluntary might eventually become mandatory anyway. Can you explain the, the concerns they have about a state-by-state -state labeling right. system? Well, clearly it's, it's very difficult to imagine a marketing structure in, in the food marketing system if you have 15, 20, 30 different labeling requirements as to what's required to be disclosed or how it's required to be labeled. There's a reason we have the Interstate Commerce Clause and that's to facilitate trade between states and, and business commerce across the country without those sort of complicated state-by-state -state regulations and, and rules that hinder trade. Uh, take another example, organic. Uh, and, and while organic itself is one way to to try and identify something that currently has no GM in it, but the organic label was a confusing label and a complicated sort of marketing structure for many, many years before uh, the, the Fed stepped in, before USDA was tasked with defining an organic label. So there's a reason and a rationale for perhaps a federal guideline or a federal preemption on what local labeling might look like. There were senators that supported this out of committee talking mm -hmm. about the voluntary initiative but say they want amendments when it comes to right. the full floor otherwise they won't support it. So how do you think this battle is going to go between the voluntary and mandatory if right. we see them both? Well we've seen the voluntary legislation proceed from committee. We've had, uh, um, have seen discussion of a mandatory proposal coming to the floor directly, um, but we also have the, the, the likely discussion that says the voluntary label uh, legislation moves forward, but it only garners support to get across the finish line if we pay attention to some of the discussion about potential compromise, and that compromise is in the form of perhaps benchmarks, um, benchmarks on if companies aren't voluntarily disclosing this information in a timely fashion uh, in, a, in an accessible way and some debate about the right approach there. Something on the label or a reference on the label to go to the website, those, those kinds of differences. But uh, imagine a voluntary guideline that has benchmarks that says uh, if the industry can achieve this, voluntary works. If the industry fails on this, you may see much more pressure for a mandatory rule down the road. What role does cost play in this? Well, cost is an interesting uh, question here because it, it's at multiple levels. The cost of the label itself is virtually insignificant. Um, the cost of the segregation that goes into fulfilling the product behind the label is pretty substantial. Uh, are you labeling the GM technology uh, produced food products where you're adding sort of a label and maybe a supply chain management system for everything you do uh, under a mandatory regime for example or are you labeling the non-GM side of this under a voluntary regime uh, the the consumer groups the interest groups that are pushing for mandatory labeling are predominantly in the non-GM camp we want we want the non-GM product well a voluntary market system that allows you to to label the non-GM product and to pay for the segregation and to pay for the labeling and to pay for the supply chain management in that system passes the cost on to the consumers that are interested in paying for it. It's, it's the interest from the non-GM side that says we want the GM side to label that pushes the cost on to the rest of the, of the food system. As far as labeling action in the Senate, we'll update you when lawmakers act on any legislation. The March Nebraska Farmer says innovative stream flow augmentation projects along the Republican River Basin have prevented major irrigation well shutdowns in South Central and Southwest Nebraska. This month's magazine says projects coordinated by the state's natural resources districts in the basin have increased stream flows by up to 80 cubic feet per second. You can read about these projects and how they keep Nebraska in compliance with the Republican River Compact in the March Nebraska Farmer. The University of Nebraska-Lincoln released a study this month on how farmers in this state perceive the effects of grazing corn residue.
Of the 108 producers in the survey, 42 didn't graze their fields, with 40% of those growers indicating it was because they felt livestock grazing would cause soil compaction. But long-term UNL research proves the practice can actually be mutually beneficial. Nebraska Extension's Tim Shaver presented those findings recently at a seminar on UNL's East Campus. We talked about the results with Tim and started by asking about the background of that research. So first of all, there was a study conducted up in Mead that had been going at the time uh, when I met with the, uh, the, the investigators had been going for about 20 years. And they were doing spring grazing and fall grazing on both corn and soybeans. And they wanted to see if there was any effects on soil physical properties and soil chemical properties. Uh, so myself and uh, some fellow colleagues from the USDA here in Lincoln went up there and soil sampled it and did some analysis to see if, in fact, grazing was causing any issues that might affect our agronomic production of both corn and soybeans. And what did the testing show? Well, what we've seen is that even after 20 years, there's very little effect, certainly no real negative effects. Uh, throughout the 20 years of the study, there was no differences in any yields with the corn or the soybeans. In terms of uh, nutrient cycling or the soil chemical properties, we saw no differences whatsoever across anything. So everything looked good there. Uh, in terms of the soil physical properties, we did see a trend for soil aggregation, which is when the soil kind of forms little particles mm -hmm. that allows for pore space in the soil so the water infiltration can occur. We did see a, some decrease in aggregation in the spring grazing, but not to a statistically significant level. So while we are seeing trends, we didn't see any actual real effects of that. The overall results, are they counter to what some farmers might think would be happening? Right, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this. A lot, a lot of the farmers who are growing the corn and soybeans just suspect that having the cows out there grazing might cause some, some ill effects, so they just might not want to do it. And we're just not seeing that. We, we think it's... All of our results show that it's a really a beneficial process for farmers to remove, in, especially in the eastern part of the state where we might have too much residue, to remove some of that residue and provide a really good uh, feed source for these cows in a way that does not appear to be affecting our agronomic production in any way. Is there a noticeable difference between grazing and baling? Yeah, so uh, we have another study out in the western part of the state where we actually are doing a very similar. It hasn't been going as long. Uh, it's been going on about uh, eight years now. But uh, after about five years, we went in and did about the same uh, level of sampling. But this study also had a, a baling component to it. So we were removing a lot more residue. And in that, we are seeing much stronger trends that the baling is causing issues. And we're also measuring soil compaction. And we are seeing that in some cases, the, the heavier equipment of baling, as opposed to having cows out there, can start to cause some concerns with baling. So because of the levels of residue that, rem that are removed with baling, generally we do not recommend that process. Is there a preference as to how much residue you should remove if compaction isn't an issue? Um, there are some studies that have looked at what is the best way to keep the nutrient cycling going. Um, generally, with the uh, cow, if the cows are on there at a level that we would recommend, then we're not removing anywhere near the a quantity that would be too much or would start to cause problems. So if the grazing is managed uh, carefully, then we're not seeing any problems with that. I think you hinted at this, but where do you want to go from here with this research? Right, so uh, a big deal is that uh, we talked about how that aggregation is, is starting to show a, a trend of decreasing. So what we really need to do is just continue looking at it. And that can be difficult because long-term studies are hard to initiate and they're hard to keep going, uh, especially if a funding cycle determines that this just isn't something that's of, of importance anymore. You can lose some of these sites. So it, it's really difficult to keep these long-term studies going, but that's what we really need to do. You know, in some of these cases, these processes take decades. And we really need to be able to just monitor them over long periods of time to see if there is a point where we do start to cause some problems. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Associate State Climatologist, Dal Dutcher. Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, the big news was the unusual warmth that we had in the region. And in fact, last week I was wondering whether or not we were going to get up into the 70s on Monday. And in fact, we well got above the 70. We got some dry air in advance of that trough that moved in through the southwestern United States. And we actually held that through Tuesday. Now, we did see some few, few scattered sprinkles and light shower activity with the piece of energy rotating around that upper air low. And of course, we've seen another secondary wave move through the western part of the state that give us some, some reasonable precipitation amounts in the panhandle, but overall we've had a very dry pattern. In fact, a vast majority of the states received less than a tenth of an inch of moisture over the last 30 days. In fact, a tenth of an inch of moisture since our big snowstorm in early uh, February. 
So now we're paying attention to our south as that upper air low that has been dropping tremendous volumes of precipitation. Looks like it may be trying to work its way northward in association with the trough coming out of the Rocky Mountains, which may actually help generate some precipitation early next week. The models are still a little bit off on regards to the timing, but overall they do indicate that that system will make its way through our region. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this uh, week will progress. First thing I'll draw your attention to is this is what is left right here of that upper air low that dumped over 15 inches of moisture to 20 inches of moisture in a 48 hour period in eastern Texas and southern Louisiana. And then we see the second piece of energy that's moving through. These will congeal to form their own little entity. And as that moves out toward the northeast, it may generate some scattered thunderstorm activity to our south and leave us basically on the northern fringe of this precipitation as we go into Sunday. We will notice another piece of energy that is trying to make its way into the Pacific Northwest. This is going to start to make its way southward into the central Rockies. But in advance of it, we're going to see some warm air moving in from the southwest. So once again, we're going to see temperatures this weekend that are easily going to breach the 70 degree mark. And it's a question of how long the 70 degree temperatures hold on as we go into Monday, we will notice that the trough starts to dig its way down to the central Rockies. So we're still going to have one more day of southwesterly flow aloft, and that should start to bring some moisture up in advance of this trough from the Gulf of Mexico. What we're going to worry about is if this thing moves too quickly, it's not going to be able to tap a lot of moisture from the Gulf, and therefore the precipitation totals will be much lighter. But as we go into Tuesday, what we'll notice is the trough digs uh, down through the central plains, and we get a secondary area of low pressure over the western Great Lakes. This will help pull in some cold air at the surface, and it looks like most of the significant moisture at this point in time is just tracking to the south of Nebraska, so just a little bit farther northward displacement, and we will see some more significant precipitation in the state of Nebraska. Now, as we get into Wednesday, Wednesday, GFS is pulling a lot more colder air in. Again, it's pushing the system all to our south, so we're going to look be between precipitation events. And as we get into Thursday, we will see a northwest flow aloft with a few pieces of waves moving on the back side of it, but we're not generating anything in any significant moisture. And then we start to see a warming pattern building back in as we get a temporary ridge building in next weekend. 8 to 14 day forecast indicates that with that trough moving in later into next week, we'll see some cooler conditions moving to the central Rockies, but it does indicate that we'll see drier than normal conditions ahead of that trough pushing into the western United United States. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, the growing season weather outlook, GMO food labeling, and research results on corn residue removal. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Next week, Roy Smith will be our market analyst, and Jerry Valeski will talk about using an annual forage system on your operation. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.